afternoon and welcome to the November 8th uh, City Council work session and I'll turn it over to Assistant City Manager. Hi. Away. I'm Chrissy Hammett, Interim Assistant City Manager. I'm sitting in today for um, John Reese and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Zach Galloway from Planning and Development to talk about the River Road Santa Clara Neighborhood Plan project update. Lots of exciting news. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Councilors. Um, I'm joined today by Jerry Finnegan uh, with the Santa Clara Community Organization and Hillary Kittleson with uh, River Roads Community Organization or representing uh, the River Road and Santa Clara areas. Uh, and they're going to take part in our presentation today. We've got um, a brief presentation, maybe take up about half of the time, and then we've got plenty of time for question and answers regarding the project. Uh, in short, um, we have been running full speed uh, since you gave us direction to uh, focus on this area uh, at the conclusion of urban growth boundary expansion uh, work, and that project concluded this summer. Uh, so we've turned our full attention there. Um, our summer activities were primarily organizational uh, and preparatory uh, throughout the month of uh, June, July, August, working with uh, neighborhood stakeholders, our planning commission, and going through kind of the normal um, preparatory things that we do internally. Uh, we've worked um, to develop a project charter and a scope of work. We brought on uh, wonderful public involvement consultants, Kajito Partners, that are a public involvement firm based here locally. Some of their staff is here. Uh, they've been invaluable. Uh, to say the least. Uh, and then by September, we were really turning our attention to uh, uh, raising awareness, getting the word out, um, helping the kind of ripple effect broaden from the community organization and the uh, leaders in the two neighborhoods that have been so engrossed in this work over the last several years uh, and just kind of trying to expand the pool of people that are aware of what's going on. Uh, so I call that kind of audience building. Um, we've also uh, attempted to get the word out um, about our kickoff event, which uh, you'll hear from Hillary uh, about later. Uh, we hosted a large uh, public event uh, on October 17th at North Eugene High School. Um, it was overflowing. Uh, <laughs> that's probably an understatement. Um, and we also uh, began to target, uh, do targeted outreach with those folks that we recognize uh, are reluctant or less likely to turn up at uh, those sorts of large public events. So uh, that was our summer and fall. Um, we'll get into more details around all of that throughout the course of the uh, of the presentation. Um, so I want to highlight um, the WHO, so kind of this collaborative approach that we've uh, embraced between the two community organizations, the city, and uh, even the county. And um, yes, there's county representatives from their planning division that are uh, helping us greatly. Um, We'll cover the basics around geography, so where is the plan um, going to be implemented, uh, and then um, I'll cover kind of the how and the when, so the project scope, which is part of the, uh, the graphic that's there at your uh, places. So um, just addressing the collaborative approach, uh, I think it's safe to say that River Road and Santa Clara have really set uh, a pretty high bar for um, neighborhood associations that have really embraced planning. They've established their own capacity um, with some support from us, but really it's been about neighborhood engagement uh, and, and them really taking ownership over that. Um, and it's impressive, to say the least. Um, that's been going on for, I'll just say, over seven years, <laughs> well beyond my, at least. Uh, and Jerry will be covering that, some of the historic background, whenever we get to that point. So. Um, We'll jump ahead. Um, if you'll turn your attention, uh, we do have a presentation. Um, planners love to talk with maps and graphics, so um, I'd feel naked otherwise. So just to uh, start with the where, um, I'll call your attention to uh, the two neighborhoods or the two community organizations. So the light gray to the north is Santa Clara, the darker gray to the south Bean River Road. Uh, to orient you to some of these dotted lines, the green line or the teal line on the very top is the metro plan boundary. The uh, blue line is the urban growth boundary. Uh, so one unique aspect of this one geographic peculiarity of this project is that uh, as a city planner, we're actually working outside the urban growth boundary uh, with Santa Clara. That was a request from the Santa Clara Community Organization that we consider the full community and recognize those rural residents. Um, that's part of the reason in collaborating closely with the county on that issue or, you know, uh, to make sure that we get those stakeholders more broadly. Um, 
The other thing to notice is what's not here, which is uh, the city limit lines, which as many of you know is uh, a patchwork of city and county properties throughout that entire area. Uh, that's because from a planning standpoint, the, the planning division has had uh, planning, zoning, permitting authority over that entire area uh, since the 80s. Uh, so purely from the planning standpoint, we do it for everybody. So um, we're you know embracing the full community there and again, uh, good good reason to collaborate with closely with our county partners and then lastly uh, I'll call your attention to the River Road corridor which is the key transit court one of the five key transit corridors that's highlighted in Envision Eugene it's where LTD is uh, considering expansion of their frequent transit network uh, be that MX or some other form of transit so um, we, we were successful in securing a Federal Transit Administration grant to uh, fund a, an even closer, more detailed look at that particular corridor uh, from a land use standpoint, design, um, how future development supports uh, transit or a future transit investment in that corridor. Uh, so that'll be rolled into this project as well, um, but it's just another unique uh, aspect that needs to be highlighted here in the, ge in the geography. Uh, from there, I'm going to turn it over to Jerry with um, discussion of the background and the history and how we got to where we are today. Yes, right here. <laughs> okay, uh, this may, uh, I, there was a, uh, an interesting quote in the paper this morning. I, I always read the quotes, and it's from Marie Curie. Uh, One never notices what has been done. One can only see what remains to be done, which means what I'm about to present to you might be totally irrelevant. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, what I'll, I will do is walk you through the journey we've been through to get here, and it has been a long journey, uh, um, and um, I, I think Zach's comment is right when he says we go back about seven years or so, actually, actually, uh, uh, it goes back further than that, uh, uh, but in terms of, of the community organizations, being the implement, the the incentive for the movement, it, it goes back about eight or nine years. Um, uh, anyway, it, uh, <clears throat> they, I think they chose me because I've been in, involved in absolutely every group since the beginning. <laughs> I was actually involved in the original refinement plan, which was uh, published in 1987. It's uh, 30 years old, and you can imagine how much this our area has changed in 30 years. And this is, even though we did our best, I agree it uh, is not it's not going to be adequate anymore um, what happened uh, to start this whole thing was that uh, commissioner Anna Morrison uh, in uh, 2000 I think it was let me check <clears throat> yeah 2000 uh, came to uh, the, the city and said how about the city and the county work together to try to figure out what this mess of public services are out in River Road and Santa Clara. She says, I've got so many calls and questions, I can't answer any of them. And and, uh, um, and it was a, a total confused mess, and it is, is still partially so. And But anyway, the city and the, the county uh, uh, sponsored the River Road Santa Clara Urban Services Committee. And that was composed of nine people from River Road and nine people from Santa Clara. And again, I was on that. Um, anyway, the... Um, uh, what they did was to look at the, the services and said, okay, you know, where are the holes and where are the overlaps and, and, uh, and, and try to d determine that and where should we go from here. And uh, in 2002, they, report, they, they filed this report and they said, really need to move forward from this and try to make some sense of all, the, all of the, the mishmash. And, um, and so the city in 2004, I think, yep, 2004, uh, hired uh, David Reed Associates and, and brought together uh, six people from River Road and six from Santa Clara for the tr transition project, the, the um, uh, River Road Santa Clara transition project. And uh, uh, the, the main thing there was to try to figure out what the community wants and what the, where the services should be and uh, what how we should tran transition into more of a, a, a standard urban services con uh, configuration and um, after uh, two years um, 
they dissolved in 2006, uh, they uh, they filed this report, and it what it did really was was identify a lot of different things that need to be done, and but with the recommendation that the the River Road and Santa Clara community organizations now it's your it's your ball you have to take it and run with it. Um, that didn't happen for a while. Uh, there were a couple other reports that we did individually, uh, but, uh, but we came together in, two, in 2009. Uh, uh, in 2009, we created something called JUST, or, or the Joint Strategy Team. Uh, we came together and said, okay, let's let's get some people together and decide where, what we're going to do and how we're going to work together and, and, and that. Uh, the uh, transition report said there should be, one of the things they said, there should be some kind of a, uh, uh, valid survey uh, uh, of the area. The, the joint strategy team looked at all the information that had already been accumulated and said, you know, this is something that maybe a few of us understand, but it's all very, very complicated. And so uh, if we were to set, and set out a sur survey, we would get garbage back, basically, because people don't understand all of this stuff. And so we, uh, the, the uh, joint strategy team uh, recommended to the community organizations that they create a, a, um, a group of outreach, <clears throat> not or education, but just outreach. The education came, came with, with the outreach, but, but it wasn't trying to convince people of anything. And, and, and uh, instead of doing a, a survey, the, the group decided to talk to as many people face to face as possible. And so there were, uh, let's see, there were six from River Road, six from Santa Clara that was in the pilot group. They uh, formed a group of 76 volunteers and uh, spent 2,000 hours and met face to face with 716 residents and, and, and got Pretty, pretty much all the priorities that people had in, in mind in terms of their community. And uh, um, this is the report that was filed. Um, uh, Commissioner Ye was there. Uh, we got a, a, a Neighborhoods USA award for, for, this, for this effort. Um, but the, the main recommendation at, after this was that, okay, now we have the information, now we need to implement it somehow. And so uh, th this was between 2010 and 2012. In 2013, the group, uh, River Road and Santa Clara approved another group called SCRIPT, Santa Clara River Road Impl Implementation Planning Team. And what SCRIPT did was take all of these recommendations, set up a whole bunch of, of, uh, of uh, living room conversations. I think there were 17 of them along with uh, so several uh, other forums and stuff. And these conversations did not change the, the, uh, the recommendations, uh, but refined them so that we said, okay, people, people like parks, okay, what do they like about parks? What do they, they still need about parks? That kind of thing. And uh, during that time, we also added a couple uh, major themes that wasn't in the scroll report, and that was uh, um, uh, public safety, which wasn't there before, but has had become an issue recently. And the other one uh, was uh, economic development, because one of the things that kept coming up was we don't have a community center, a, a commercial center. Everyone has to go from our area to other places in town to to, to find their their services. So, so uh, the, that's that's where we ended up. And and uh, then earlier this year, of course, you uh, favored us with with the resources to go ahead and move ahead with a neighborhood plan. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, so we, we thought it was important to cover that. Um, Jerry provided a similar update or, or background um, summary uh, on October 17th so that all those people in attendance at North Eugene High School knew what had already transpired. Um, others spoke and shared their passion and motivation for getting involved. Uh, but we thought it was very helpful just to um, share in summary what's transpired. Um, 
and just to know kind of the, the commitment that the two community organizations have already made. Um, it's also um, relevant for you today uh, in relation to the graphic that I handed out and to this uh, that's on in the presentation. Uh, it's essentially everything that's upstream in this river. Uh, it's all the background that's got us to um, starting the project. So we may have only started the project this fall as far as you know, city planning staff or county planning staff, uh, but clearly it's been going on for years uh, and there's been a, a huge investment on the part of these two community organizations. Um, so we started, uh, like I said, in the summer uh, with preparatory activities and developing the scope of work and recognized pretty quickly that just laying out a Gantt chart with all these little lines and dates and milestones with asterisks was not very visually engaging and didn't really excite people um, as far as where we were headed over the next 18 months. Uh, so in working with our consultants, uh, we've developed uh, a, an idea that would be much more visually engaging uh, and a local artist, uh, Melinda Nettles, uh, took our kind of dry, crusty Gantt chart and turned it into this, which is, uh, it, which is great. Uh, and tells a much more in, engaging story about where we are headed in the next 18 months as we head downstream. Um, <clears throat> let's see, so I think I've zoomed in so we can talk through each of these uh, one by one. Uh, so the first phase in which we find ourselves right now is the reaching out phase. So. This fall, we are committed completely to just reaching out to neighbors, uh, folks that live there, that work there, uh, that go to school in the neighborhoods, uh, and understanding what their issues are. So it's based on the strong foundation that you heard from Jerry of you know a lot of the public outreach that they already did. Um, and we're doing that through the community event, which Hillary will touch on briefly, uh, but also more targeted outreach with small groups uh, and even um, business canvassing along the main corridors. Um, jump ahead here. Uh, by next spring, we will take all of that, create you know, this vision for what the future holds based on this public input. Um, and begin to translate the vision and the public input into an action plan. So um, yes, goals and policies, but also programs and projects and uh, ways that you know, we can implement the plan in a way that uh, impact people's lives on a, on a daily basis. Um, you'll see that you're included in this graphic up in the upper right corner, Eugene City Councilors and Planning Commission. Uh, the raft heading downstream um, is just kind of symbolic to show that that group, the community stakeholders, the decision makers in the community, as well as um, as elected officials, will kind of be there at these key milestones moving through the project, um, and we'll come back with these sorts of updates um, at those major milestones. Here's the vision. Here's how it relates to other citywide goals. Here's what we've heard from the neighborhood. So you'll see us again in the spring doing this all over again. Um, we continue moving downstream. We get to what we've called making it happen, uh, which was our attempt to kind of strip out the jargon and not use words, plan implementation, but instead making it happen. What are we going to do at the end of this plan? Yes, we're going to adopt it. We recognize we need to include adoption because that's where we're headed with, uh, with you and the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, but making it happen and then calling out specifically development standards, zone changes as the planning division, we know we can control that. Um, so we're committed to kind of carrying that forward concurrently with a neighborhood plan um, based on that public input. We're working closely with um, other agencies um, around, the, around the city and the county and even you know, LTD and Safe Routes to Schools. So people that are not um, city or county affiliated as well. Um, so we have less control over <laughs> some of uh, what they can commit to uh, in the short run, but we're at least uh, leading the way and putting that up there front and center that um, the public knows that that's kind of where we're headed uh, with this public uh, process and with this neighborhood plan. Um, so in all, we anticipate a time frame of about 18 months. We're about three months into that already. Uh, and uh, let's see if we move forward, um, and of course the, uh, the adoption phase uh, there at the end. I'll just call your attention also that there's no rapids here, and we'd like to, <laughs> we'd like to keep it that way. We'll keep it free of obstacles in the river. Um, 
and we've established a great foundation or um, with the amount of public involvement we're already um, taking on. So um, just to give you a quick rundown of everything we're doing to raise awareness, you know, we we're out, um, and you'll see this in the video at the conclusion of the presentation, we were out at Sunday streets. We were um, at different events throughout the community um, providing flyers and invitations to the October uh, event. Uh, we use that graphic that's in front of you on a large poster board, and that just sucked people in right off the bike path as they were at Sunday streets and asking questions about that. And what is this beautiful uh, mural almost that's, uh, that's here? Um, we did uh, direct mailing to everybody in both neighborhoods in advance of that October 17th meeting. We've got a giant and growing uh, e-newsletter list. Um, and then I have to call out uh, the great volunteer. I don't know that we have 76 volunteers currently, as Jerry said, about the squirrel project. Uh, but we have a pretty deep bench that we can call on uh, regularly and, and get people out to assist with outreach. Um, obviously, there's a project web page if anybody wants to uh, venture over there. Uh, we've provided things uh, always in Spanish, just recognizing the large uh, Latino population in both of these neighborhoods. Uh, we were at River Road or El Camino del Rio's uh, grand opening, doing a lot of this uh, more targeted outreach. Um, and we'll continue doing that throughout the fall uh, so that while the large event um, on October 17th, I would say, was a, was a success, we recognize that certain people don't come to those meetings, so we are doing targeted outreach with um, PTA at local schools to make sure we get young parents, um, that we get the Latino community that maybe saw Spanish as a barrier and didn't attend this particular workshop, although we were prepared for them. Um, and then, I guess, the week after Thanksgiving, uh, the county's taking the lead uh, with our support and doing the same sort of outreach with uh, rural residents in Santa Clara. So that's just a, a feel for what we're doing beyond just kind of the, the conventional large workshop. Um, so lastly, I'll just cover what we did kind of from a technical standpoint uh, on the 17th at, uh, at North Eugene High School's uh, gymnasium. Catherine, can you pass these to down and we'll hand this over to Council Pryor. Um, are they all the same? Oh yeah, there are. So what I'm passing around is a deck of cards um, that attempts to take the real detailed information that scroll and then script got into. They were uh, into really detailed um, solutions and ideas for the neighborhood and we recognized that we needed to bring that up to a little bit higher level uh, and make it engaging and um, legible for people that are coming into a, a neighborhood planning process pretty cold. Um, so we developed a game, um, a bit of a game for our, from our planning standpoint. Um, and you see that in the upper left corner there um, as we split everybody into groups. Um, we ask them to share where they live, introduce themselves, uh, use these cards to um, answer two, really two basic questions. What do you value about the neighborhood today? What do you love about it? What do you want to retain? Uh, and then what's your hope for the future? And we ask them to pick a card out of that deck that uh, allowed them, that kind of prompted them to talk about their neighborhood uh, in a way that gave us information that we could use for the future planning process. You'll notice there's numbers that are coded there, so we ask them also to say, you know, I love the river. Well, where on this whole riverfront is most important to you? Oh, like, well, I, I will actually write in to for nature, for riverfront on this particular location, so we can then take that information from the map, feed it to our partners at the Willamette River Keeper or with Parks and Open Space, so they have that information uh, in a very detailed geographic way. Then we also ask them, uh, and I know Hillary will get the, into this more, um, kind of the, the, how it all played out, but we also ask, what's the hope for the future? Um, so if we jumped ahead, um, you'll see we had these my idea sheets. So what's your hope for the future? We asked people to draw. A lot of people felt more comfortable just writing. So we have some like this that are pretty fun just to check out um, with little sketches. And we have some that are just a full paragraph of ideas of things they would change and things they hope for the future that would happen in their neighborhood. Um, 
so these have been really fun to go through. Um, you see here, um, somebody wants sidewalks. They don't, um, instead of walking on the side of the street. Um, so hopefully we then take, we go back to the cards and we can see where people wrote um, or use their coding for T for transportation and put that on the map and we can start to see where um, people felt like they needed sidewalks or um, things, safety concerns were, were a point of discussion. Uh, somebody else wanted um, a library in River Road, um, apparently one with a green roof with trees on top. Um, and then again, you know, you kind of see like urban infill on the right side with three-story multifamily. And, you know, somebody was very savvy as um, where they wanted to, to take their discussion uh, as opposed to the person who just wants the library down the street. So. There's a range of options where, or a range of ideas out there, and we're uh, in the process of calling through all this data and getting a feel for what um, actually took place on the 17th. Um, and then in our small group um, targeted outreach, we're also replicating this. So um, as you saw in these pictures, it was eight or 10 people at a round table in the gymnasium, and they did this with a deck of cards, but we're also doing it in somebody's living room and um, out in Santa Clara um, at the school with the PTA group. Um, so it can be kind of right-sized and we're continuing to do that um, engagement and that outreach. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Hillary uh, who has a quick, uh, has a summary of what took place um, on the 17th. Good afternoon. So it's my task to give you a flavor for the event and to summarize the themes from um, a facil table facilitator debrief that happened a few days after. Um, so those table facilitators were both neighbors and uh, Lane County and city uh, staff. And then I snuck in as a note taker. So um, as my husband and I walked toward uh, the high school, one thing I noticed, gee, there were cars all over the place. And, and we're walking toward the gym door and I'm thinking there must be a game or something else going on because there were so many people and we were streaming and we were greeted by the smiling face of Bev Barr. I don't know if you know, there she is. Um, and who was directing us where to go. And we got there a little bit early, which was good because as we're in the hallway before you get to the gym were these platters of actually quite excellent sandwiches, which uh, w they ran out because uh, they had thought there'd be 200 people. They planned for 300, pretty good, you know, nice thing. Almost 400 people showed up, from babies to elders. So that was, that was really fantastic. So we walked in and we chose a table, a River Road table of our choosing. So the River Road and Santa Clara neighborhood tables. And uh, we didn't know anyone at our table. Um, some people chose to sat, sit together and their neighbors are talking all over the place. Um, and our facilitator was a Lane County planning staff member. There was handshakes and welcoming smiles, very relaxed atmosphere. And each table had a map, and we began by indicating where we lived on the map. And so then people were talking about, oh, you're right around the corner, or that kind. It was a great icebreaker. And then the map was also used, as Zach said, to point out or to mark um, specifics when we got to the table exercise. Then there were introductions by Zach and by uh, Jerry, Bev, Carlene, and Kate Pearl that were brief, they were informative, and they were very, very welcoming. And the neighbors really spoke from their heart. I'm not saying you don't have a heart, yeah, but I'm saying they, were, <laughs> they really spoke from their heart, which I think was set a great tone for the event. Um, and then most of the event was, was devoted to that table exercise with the cards and with uh, characteristics. And there was, as we were passing the cards around, there was some good natured whining about take, oh, you took my card, you know? And uh, so how we solved that as the, I was taking notes and, and somebody was talking about parks or something, then four or five others would say, well, put me down for that. And then I did tick marks uh, on, on that to, so that people had that sense. Um, so there was a note taker chosen by the group at each, at each table. And then the last event of the evening was a reporting out from the tables. And meanwhile, the cards that had been selected 
uh, with the favorite neighborhood characteristics were gathered up and then they were arrayed on a wall not quite as big as this but a, a large wall by category so you could visually walk you could see it even from my place but as you walk up you could really see uh, the clusters of cards and the categories of cards and I think that was also very helpful um, so much information was gathered from a lot of people in a relatively short amount of time and in a very convivial atmosphere. And at my table, at least, people were excellent listeners. So then we had the debrief a few days later, and uh, Zach asked about the general feeling of, of the group. And as we went around the table, it was striking to me how each facilitator used the word, almost every facilitator used the word positive, and one facilitator called it a love fest. <laughs> now, only one facilitator reported a primarily neg negative tone at the table, and this was a, a group of people who chose to sit together, as that's an option, who were all um, uh, remembering the sewer wars of 30 years ago. So that was there, but it was certainly uh, not the major voice of the event. And then as for themes, it was very clear how much people love the natural resources in their neighborhood. I mean, this is big, and people are speaking from here about the river, about their ability to garden with, and, you know, on these large lots with great soil, on their love for their parks, and, um, and, to, and their love for the farms at the, at the northern edge and, and their access to that and how important they think that is for the community. There was also a lot of talk about transportation, traffic congestion, pedestrian safety, and the promise of rapid transit. And governance also came up from multiple angles, uh, whether it was police services and, you know, who, who gets what, depending on where you live, as well as code enforcement, which it, it was, yes, a lot of planning services are, are um, uh, provided by the city, but not code enforcement. So the, the, the governance issues did come up with some questions around annexation as a potential solve uh, for some of those. Uh, and also, people are very interested in having places to walk to where they can grab a cup of coffee and sit and talk with their friends and meet up at, at, uh, at or at local markets. They want a local market, and they want to be able to, to meet their just get there by walking. So that, that was a big, big uh, thing. So that's just a taste of the event. And looking forward, um, the neighbors uh, who, were, who were table facilitators emphasized how important it was to build on this successful event with continual emphasis on outreach and on education, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And that it be delivered in a collaborative manner. So the neighbors and the they, they, neighbors want neighbors and staff to be doing this together, uh, from both city and county, and that was much at evidence at the North event, and also support and presence of elected officials it would be invaluable, to both city and county. So I would like to conclude by expressing our deep appreciation to the city for funding this effort and to, for the excellent staff support that we have received. We really, really appreciate it. And we're very excited about the potential of what this could mean for River Road and Santa Clara. So I know we're going a little long. Um, it's a big, big part of the city, 30,000 people, um, or a large part of the community, uh, so almost 30,000 people. So uh, in conclusion, we've got a um, about two-minute video um, that runs through um, a lot of that background, um, where we've been, the outreach that we've done. Um, we've worked with... Uh, Chris Trochi, who is a senior in the UO School of Journalism, he's a photojournalist. Um, this captured a lot of this um, outreach that we've done. Uh, and working with Kajito, um, we've uh, really formed some great alliances with different organizations in the community like St. Vincent de Paul, Food for Lane County, the local schools, and uh, again, kind of found those people that maybe aren't 
don't come to this chamber um, and also uh, don't necessarily uh, come to North Eugene High School for a big public workshop. So um, always important to see the faces of people um, that are in our community and that have provided this feedback. Um, I am not sure if I can make this go from where I am, but it's embedded there. There it is. It's just music. There's no narration. If you want to oh. just let it run, it'll be okay. Okay, so I think that gives you a feel for what's, what's gone on thus far this fall, um, and we'll continue, I guess, with the next month, continuing our outreach and gathering more input. So I'm happy to answer any questions about the project, and I know um, these guys would be happy to as well. Thank you. So I have, thank you. It was a wonderful presentation, and I love the materials. I have Mike and Alan and Blair. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I want to thank you for the presentation, Zach, and, and certainly to all of the neighbors who are out here who've worked so hard for so long, and I know that there is still so much more to do. A considerable thank you to you. I, I've been a member of council for nearly 11 years now, and I know fact certain that Jerry here, and I see Ann back there too, have been working on some form of this for much longer than I've been on council. So I know that there's a there's lifelong dedication in this work, so thank you. Um, would it be fair to say that the, the, the plan as a whole that, that led from script, that led from all the efforts that come before it, from, from my perspective, this seems to me like an effort to protect the quality of life as it exists for the residents in this area of our community. Is that a fair statement, you think? <clears throat> uh, it's a fair statement. Um, it's one that I think we articulate and envision Eugene with our pillars around um, neighborhood livability, but also recognizing that the whole community, not just these two neighborhoods, but the entire community will continue to grow. Uh, and that's something that we've talked about with um, with the script members. Right. And we need to plan for that and understand right. how that growth will impact well, every that's, neighborhood. That's kind of my point, because when it comes to protecting quality of life of this area, I think it's awesome. I grow enough food every year in my little backyard for <clears throat> to last the, re the, the whole of the year, and I think that kind of quality of life is critical. I think it's important, and protecting that is a, a thing that I think is a valuable effort by the city. But we've also set a bunch of goals 
that come that don't necessarily come into conflict with this, but working out those differences is difficult. So, for example, when this council sets a goal that says all new development is going to have a mix of 55-45 multifamily versus single-family homes, what I want to hear is how are you going to how along River Road. <clears throat> which is predominantly where I would think a lot of those multifamily, a lot, not all, of those multifamily units are going to have to go. How is the, I, I know it's preliminary, this is a preliminary report. What's the general 30,000 foot thinking about how we incorporate the existing plans in the nature of what's being done to protect the livability of the neighborhood? That's where those two intersect is the part where I want to have the most discussion. I think the, the planning and the, the best outcomes are awesome, and I'm all for them, and I'll, I'll vote right with them the whole time. But that's going to rub up against some stuff that this council majority has planned that I don't understand how you accomplish, especially with one major thoroughfare in that area. And we had 3,000 new homes needing to be built last year and 2,000 a year before that. And the numbers are going to probably continue to rise in our community. What percentage of them go here? Uh, and how do we do that? And that, those are this, all good questions. Uh, this is the this is the kind of conversation I can hope is 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 driven from this. Um, I only have ten seconds left, and I really would like a second round because there's a much more important question I want to ask. So can I have a second round, please, Mayor? Yes, although I do want to caution the council that we have five minutes left for this session, <laughs> and we have another important meeting. So it may be some things will be discussed later, but let's get everyone through their first round. So Claire. Thank you. Um, I don't have any questions, just a lot of praise and gratitude. Um, uh, I, I've served less, uh, uh, fewer years than Mike, but when I came on to council, you, this neighborhood and, and both neighborhoods were already well underway as far as I could see in terms of leadership development and capacity building and um, well ahead of the city in terms of your preparation for the work that we are now formally engaged in with you. So I really want to uh, express my gratitude for that leadership and for all the other folks who have been involved in this uh, that you are here at the table representing as well. Um, and I think, you know, you uh, have, have in my mind validated that um, difficult vote that some of us took to you know, redirect planning staff to this part of the community by the hard work you've done to bring us to this place and that I know you're gonna be ready to do going forward. Um, re regrettably, I wasn't able to attend your kickoff event, um, but uh, I was getting <laughs> updates from uh, Representative Julie Fahey while she was there, who was very impressed with the turnout and the engagement. Um, and I was able to attend the recent uh, neighborhood meeting of Santa Clara uh, neighborhoods and learned there that some of the Santa Clara board members had actually stood uh, in the lobby of the uh, nearby Fred Meyer for about four hours on a Saturday and spoke to many, many people during that time about this upcoming meeting, what was going on, engaging further. And that's the kind of real on the ground work that can make such a difference uh, in getting people engaged in a real substantive way in these efforts. And then I just really want to appreciate the very creative approach that was taken um, at the meeting. Uh, very engaging, not technical, not creating barriers to people to feel that they have to have some kind of big technical background before they can come and say what their vision is for their community. Um, and you really gave people an entree into the process that I, I'm sure for many people broke down a lot of barriers for them to think that they could participate too. Uh, so I, I really want to commend everyone uh, on that. So I'm very excited to also share your excitement uh, about how this effort is being officially launched after so many years of preparation. And I'm very hopeful that it will continue on such a positive footing. So thank you very much. Alan? Well, I think you guys pulled off a minor miracle. You made planning fun. <laughs> You know, six, 76 volunteers, 716 citizens involved, 400 people at your event. Might have been the free food, but uh, that's just amazing. That's just amazing that you guys were able to pull all this together and, and pull it and make it very successful. And Jerry, uh, you're just the embodiment of institutional memory. Uh, 
and I, I thank you for your service to the neighborhood for all those many years. Uh, it's people like you that make our neighborhood special and, and make Eugene special because that makes everything much more real and, and, and with some continuity over the, over the years. Um, the, the outreach, I think, was amazing. It's very innovative. Uh, I like the collaborative part about the fun part of it. Um, uh, it also makes people own it more uh, when they're when it's collaborative like that. Unfortunately, I think you guys set the bar too high for everybody else. Um, the, uh, the the map this is amazing. Uh, Melinda Nettles, Lean One Creative Works. This is really amazingly good, um, and and uh, I can see how that would bring people in. Uh, if, if if this sets the tone, it's going to be fun and innovative and, and cool to participate in it. Um, uh, it makes me almost want to move there. <laughs> almost. Um, I think that y you uh, you guys also have become the poster child for the mandatory acronym law with scroll and script and all the other ones that you've come up with. Um, uh, also, Jerry, all your history also points out that that planning is is uh, is something that's ongoing. It's not something that kind of ends. It's kind of like the Golden Gate Bridge. When you get to the end of painting it, you start over and you go through it. And that's what that's what planning is. And all these plans get updated over and over because the neighborhoods change and, they, and it needs to be needs to be modernized. Um, the I have a question about the FTA grant. How much is it? What's the timeline for it? That's kind of driving this. It's four hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. It's a collaborative effort between the city and LTD, um, so they'll be involved. Um, and it, the time frame is about the same as the neighborhood plan, so it really funds that more intense look at the River Road corridor. How did you get it? Um, we've jointly filed. For, um, with LTD uh, last year, I believe. And and so this triple transit analysis, similar to the city's triple bottom line, what's that? I haven't heard that before. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so uh, it is an attempt to look at um, any sort of vision or master plan for that corridor through the lens of neighborhood livability, uh, transit support, uh, and economic development. So what's the impact um, of a particular master plan concept mm -hmm. um, with those three um, kind of key areas in mind. So a different take on the triple bottom line analysis. Yeah, where were they again? Economic development, uh, transit support, and neighborhood livability. So kind of the impact of, um, and this is really speaks to Councillor Clark's question as well, that the neighborhood plan and the FTA grant um, as a part of that is the effort, is the opportunity to take this kind of large, high-level Envision Eugene concepts and tailor them to what fits in each neighborhood. And that might look different. Um, we know it looks different on Franklin Boulevard than it will in River Road. Mm -hmm. The 450000 that's just the grant. And then there, what's the overall budget for this process? Uh, there's the, the grant is 450, and then uh, through supplemental budget allocations um, that you all have uh, approved, uh, we're working with a little over well $100,000 in this year, and the grant is yet to uh, come to us, so we haven't started that work yet. <laughs> um, I guess the one thing I ask is what's the applicability of this to other neighborhoods you did set the bar kind of high but uh you know it's, every neighborhood's unique and and uh, mm -hmm. uh and this isn't a cookie cutter process but uh, i'm glad we shifted away from a process that was inherently kind of negative to one that's extremely positive and <coughs> forward looking and and, uh, and and very cool so how does this get applied back out to the rest of the neighborhoods uh i think the success here um so you're right, it's not cookie cutter and nothing ever should be. Um, but I think the success here uh, that we've had to date is really more about the two community organizations and the foundation that they have established. Um, so in that way, it really sets a, a high bar, yes, but it's the model um, that we would uh, love to form that relationship with our different neighborhood associations um, and help them grow and kind of establish a similar capacity um, and, a, um, you know, and have that volunteer pool and um, have a much more collaborative approach, I think, in all of our neighborhood um, planning efforts or small area planning efforts. Very laudable goal. Thank you, all three of you. Can't wait to hear more. Emily? 
Thank you. Good job. It looks very happy and complete. Um, I'm still surprised that you didn't start with this area since they've been working on it for decades. Uh, I like the outreach. I wonder how it compares to the outreach that didn't work in South Willamette. Uh, I hope this is successful and doesn't get turned around, as some projects do here, and uh, that it's quick and affordable. I'm wondering, uh, 10000 this year, what are you expecting in the next two years? Um, who are the consultants? Where do they come from? How much did they cost? Is this, uh, I guess it's supplemental budget, so that's general fund. And uh, you've reached a lot of people. What percentage of the residents do you think you've reached so far? Mm. Uh, City residents. So the, uh, the budget uh, items I think would be helpful if I just provided that in writing to everybody since we've got several questions about that. Um, and as far as how many people are reaching, uh, that's a good question. I don't have that off the top of my head. We know there's about 30,000 people in both communities. There were 400 people on October 17th. Obviously, that's a drop in the bucket, but we're attempting to expand that as broadly as possible. Um, and that's something that we'll uncover you know, as we move forward um, and look back at um, e-newsletters and how broad the outreach has been and what the attendance is at different um, activities. So we can we can provide an update on that later. And the consultants? Oh, uh, they're actually in the room. Um, Kajito, uh, Ellen Tennedy on the front row, and Julie Fisher in the back have been um, there every step of the way in this initial public uh, involvement phase. And how much did they cost? Um, I don't have that off the top of my head, so we can provide that in writing for everybody. Okay. Okay. Um, Mike, I know you have a second round. I don't know if anyone else needs a first round. I am watching the clock because we have an important conversation. So I'm wondering if you can hold that. We'll, this will not be the last of our conversations about River Road Santa Clara, or if you want to put your question on the table. But I don't want to divert to a long conversation no. now when we have another agenda item. Just a quick item. Okay, go for it. I I raised previously. Livability protection versus incorporating density goals of the whole city in this area and what part should it take? Um, there's another piece of this that I want to get to sometime soon with staff and I see the rest of them out there so I, I'm hoping we're coming back to talk about what this looks like. Um, we have an, a lot of other city goals that um, this area makes it more difficult to implement. For example, Vision Zero. In a patchwork, uh, you know, there's 22,000 people in this area of the community with similar expectations to everybody else, but they're not city residents and they don't pay city taxes. So I have advocated for a very long time that the easiest way out for us from this point is to look at the city presenting voluntary opportunities to annex into the city in a way that it's in the interest of those residents to do so. I would never advocate that we did any manner of annexation efforts that were anything but voluntary. But as it stands right now, this, in my opinion, the, the city needs those 22,000 residents worse than those 22,000 residents need the city. And it's only going to become more so over time, especially as the city residents in that area have expectations that come into conflict with the structure of having a patchwork of city and county. And I don't think there's going to be an easier time to have that conversation at some point in the future for us to make it easy for all of them to join the rest of us. And I think this seems to me like the best time to do it. And I'm hoping we're going to have more of a conversation about that. How do we implement citywide policies and zoning and all of the other things that we want to see done in a patchwork of city versus county? Or should we, at this point, be looking to change that? Thank you. Uh, you Councilor Clark, I was just going to say that we'll continue to respond to your questions about annexation and the work that's happening in that area, and we'll get back to you with some of what's happening or planned to be happening. So. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you very much. It's inspiring. We're excited about the work that you've done. Thank you so much for your excellent community organizing and communication, and thanks for presenting to us. Thank you so much, Zach. Building the models. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we, yeah, that's why we, you know, we don't have any, any guidelines. <laughs> no, but you're doing good work. <laughs> Place like. <laughs> I get one for every name. <laughs> All right, let's go on to our next topic. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the next topic is a discussion about boards and commissions. We'll be providing some information and then um, uh, here to answer questions and engage with council in discussion that you want to learn more about what's happening in that area. So with that, I'll turn over to Jason Dedrick. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Jason Dedrick. I'm a policy analyst in the city manager's office. Um, you had previously expressed, expressed an interest in a work session on boards and commissions. Uh, what uh, staff will provide, what I'll provide, is just a brief overview of kind of the context of the program and some of the work that staff has been doing related to boards and commissions. Uh, it may serve, or hopefully it will serve as kind of a, some context and, and tee up your conversation <coughs> on whatever topics related to this you want to explore. So I have just a couple of slides. Um, that I'll move through pretty quickly just kind of to set up your discussion. So uh, in general, there are, as a reminder, there are five types of committees that, um, that the city works with. There are standing committees, ad hoc committees, departmental advisory committees, intergovernmental committees, and then any other committees that might be established by city charter. Um, some, uh, most of what I'm going to be talking about today in ter terms of setting the context are those standing committees, the ones that the council has created specifically and codified specifically to help uh, work with either staff or council on implementing programs or policy. Uh, but of course your discussion may range broader than that. Uh, another item that's important that I know that you've discussed is that council liaison role. So of those seven standing committees, three of them have formal liaisons from council um, to those committees. Uh, one of course is budget committee, which you are all a member of, so that's a fourth. Uh, you, there are a total of 22 committees um, that have a co council liaison, and so and I've provided uh, that list is an attachment to the AIS, uh, so that serves as a resource to you if that's something that you want to talk about. Um, recently, staff have been uh, staff have been convening other staff who serve in a support role to various boards and commissions, and so we've been asking them: Are there things that we can do out of the city manager's office to help make your work easier, better, streamlined? Uh, so we've gathered some feedback from them, and they've also relayed along to us some feedback from uh, their board and commission members uh, as well. So uh, just a quick recap of some of what we've heard recently and what we're working on. So we've convened that group of staff uh, twice now uh, in the last four months. Uh, we are going to continue to work to streamline the recruitment and interview process for filling vacancies. Um, you had a taste of that this last round in terms of some improvements there. We're going to continue to work for ways to streamline and improve that process. Uh, we are going to continue working on member orientation and training. We've heard from our staff that that's a really key need to make sure everybody comes on with the same grounding, the same footing on what it means to be a member of a board and, uh, or committee, uh, what it means to be uh, working in the public sector for local government in that capacity. So we're going to continue to work there. Also just sort of meetings one-on-one. -on -one. What does it mean to chair a meeting? What does it mean to follow Robert's rules? Uh, what's sort of the protocol that's best to follow during uh, during meetings. Uh, staff have been working with boards and commissions on this, but rolling that into the training and making sure everyone comes in with that can be an advantage to how those groups work. Um, staff are working t at the staff level to c collaborate between boards and commissions when we hear of topics that are coming up and multiple entities where staff can find ways to uh, coordinate internally uh, to help make that work course go more smoothly. So there's a piece of that out there. Uh, and then we are also going to uh, continue working on our website. Uh, to make it uh, an easier interface so that maybe the websites look similar when uh, the public wants to learn about our boards and commissions. There are a lot of different uh, uh, committees out there. Our websites are a little different. Some it's easier to find the bylaws, some it's not. Uh, so we're going to work to streamline that a bit so that there's a, an easier interface there for the community. And then in terms of what uh, our staff have related that they've heard from their members, uh, wishing for a better connection with council, I can't go into detail on what that means because that's obviously subjective. So uh, you can explore what better connection means. It means different things to different uh, board and commission members. 
uh, a desire to have their membership be more representative of the community. This, I think, rolls right back to recruitment. Uh, we have been striving very hard to meet um, guidelines that we've set forward in our equity and human rights planning to try to make that membership as rep representative of the community as possible, and that's an effort we will continue to make. But we have heard that from membership uh, on those different boards as they're doing their work. Uh, we've also heard questions from them about uh, wanting some role clarity. What does it mean to advise the city council? What does it mean to advise the city manager? Uh, and trying to understand a little bit better what their role is. And then any way that um, they're also interested in exploring any joint uh, board and commission efforts. So, uh, for example, the work that went on uh, in the Clear Lake area related to the urban growth boundary where you had a couple of groups working together. Uh, there are other issues that often run across uh, multiple boards and commissions. So there are things you can imagine relate between Planning Commission and Sustainability Commission or between Sustainability Commission and Human Rights Commission and how might those entities work together to do that. Uh, I'll draw your attention really quickly before I wrap up here on the uh, attachment that just profiles uh, the seven standing uh, committees uh, as a way to highlight some of the differences that are out there. So not all of them have council liaisons. They are all very different in terms of what their charge is. We have a couple that are statutorily required. We have a couple that are more task oriented in service to staff. And then we have a few that are more uh, work in more of an uh, advocacy capacity. So the work and the uh, issues that come up vary uh, amongst those groups and as you can imagine the toxic sport is very different from the Human Rights Commission and the things they talk about and the way they operate and the way they relate to you. Uh, there are differing uh, mechanisms for advising the city. Um, six of the seven have in their, uh, their enacting language that they advise city council uh, and then three of the seven have uh, in their language that they advise the city manager. And so that role clarity, there's some question about what does that mean to advise the city manager or to advise city council? And then their relationship with you varies as well. Some come and provide you an annual or submit an annual report to you. Some come and present an annual work plan that you approve. So again, more kind of variability there just to know about that. And then I know Councillor Zelenka had asked about uh, where we have uh, overlap between boards and commissions, so where we have members that serve in a dual capacity. And the one way that we have that formally is uh, really drives out of the police commission that the police commission has a member that serves both there and on human rights commission and both on police commission and the civilian review board. So that's the one place that we currently have sort of that membership. Uh, so that's it in terms of what I have and um, really open it up for whatever discussion you'd like to have. Thank you. I actually just want to help you. Thank you initially just for this layout and the both lists and went through my own little sheet because it is almost baffling. There are so many of these and they are so different. I have uh, Betty up and then Chris and Alan. All right, Betty, take it away. Oh, thank you. Um, first, I would like to know when each of these was established. I know that council has established committees and I think it's easy to start a new commission but it seems impossible to terminate one. I think I think we should consider whether they have served their purpose or whether they had a good purpose or whether it's they've done what they can do and it's time to let it go. Uh, but one that is not here anymore, and it's a different kind of thing, the Citizen Involvement Committee, I think, should be reestablished. That was a good way to get people involved in government, and it served a really good purpose, I thought. But for each of these, I think we should think, do we still need it? For example, the Police Commission. It was started after the auditor, there was a attempt to get an auditor before the one that succeeded. And when it was voted down, this was Jim Johnson's idea of something to do instead of having an auditor. It's not the same thing, but it was kind of a consolation prize, I guess. Uh, Jim Johnson, in case, you don't, in case you've forgotten, he was a city manager at the time. And I think that well, for one thing, I don't think it's needed anymore, but I think that it was supposed to ad advise the council about advising the police department, and it hasn't come through the council at all. It has been a direct relationship with the police department, and I think we should think, do we still need it? And I, th I would like to go through each one and think, Obviously, we st the Budget Committee and the Planning Commission are the two that are required by law, right? Correct. 
and we can't do anything about those unless we go to the legislature if we thought we didn't need those. But um, the others, I, th I think we should go through each one and think, what's it doing? Has it done what it was supposed to do? Has it finished what it was supposed to do? And do we still need it? That's, I don't know how that's, whether that's possible or not. It's like you can't, it's, it would be very hard to kill any of them, I think. Thank you. Uh, Chris? Yeah, thank you for the presentation. It's, uh, it's a great starting point for what needs, is a lot of work. And most of the um, interests I had uh, were up in your presentation, so I really appreciate how you've captured um, not only um, the interests that we may have, but interests from the committees and other people that work with them. <clears throat> and I know that um, uh, some of the areas that are of particular interest for me uh, were the ones around uh, understanding the role of the group and how it how its relationship to the council is more effectively uh, developed so that they can be more responsive to what the council needs and then in return we also need to have a conversation about how we can be more responsive to our committees um, I don't see it as a one-way communication it's really a two-way communication and some of the challenges I've had serving on committees in the past is uh, where does our work go? How is it accepted by the by the council? Does the council do anything with it? Can I just be ignored if you don't like what you're hearing from me? Um, I think that's that's one area. So it's it's a mutual responsibility thing. How do we um, encourage and support each other? Um, and then another element was um, I, I guess I could boil it down to a notion of consistency and standards for all of the, the boards and committees. Each one has its own set of operating rules. And some of those operating rules are great, could actually be ported over to other committees and would probably help them. Some of them have um, operating rules that could actually create conflicts, either between themselves and other committees, which I've seen in the past, or between that committee and the council, which I've also seen in the past. I don't think anybody wants to have a conflict with another group or with the council, um, but I think by creating some more consistency and standardization between committees and how they operate and what their rules are, um, we can avoid a, a lot of problems. Um, the notion of having member training um, and orientation and kind of meeting 101 I think goes a long way towards helping those committees work more effectively. Um, but I, I think it's also helpful for them to be well grounded in their role in the city vis-a-vis -vis advancing or, as you put here, advocating for city policy and who actually forms the policy that is then promoted by a committee and what is the two-way street for how those policies get established. So uh, that's why I see this as a starting point. There's a, there's a lot of things we can do, but I think all of them will be geared towards making both the council and the committee structure much more effective in its interactions, both between those two groups and also between each other. Alan. Yeah, thanks, Jason. The, I have three interests here. Um, one is I think there is a lot to be had in terms of benefits for the committees and also the community and the council for having more formalized committee to committee relationships. You mentioned the only one we actually have uh, formalized is the police commission CRB one. Um, I know that the ones that I sit on, they, they have informal ones. And uh, when the Sustainability Commission was here, they were talking about it would be really nice if they were more formalized and they're more real and they have real purpose. Uh, so I would be interested in figuring out which one, which committee to committee uh, liaisons, not council liaisons, but committee members to other committee members make sense. You know, um, and you know, for instance, the. Uh, Sustainability Plan Commission one, Sustainability Commission, um, um, Human Rights Commission, triple bottom line. Those make a ton of sense to me. So there might be other ones that uh, that that make a lot of sense too. So I'd like to see uh, us look at that. The the other um, interest that I have is in clarifying the role of the committees, um, and. Uh, 
they say, you know, advise the council, but people don't really know what that means. And I often find that that's very confusing to folks that aren't sitting on the council. And um, and then we, as a council, don't do a very good job of reaching back out to the, the committees and asking them. The, uh, my thought is, are all of these groups that we belong to are kind of trusted advisors to the council? They provide us with input. And that formal structure, I think, needs to be laid out a little bit more clearly. Uh, uh, I, one of the things that the, I use the Sustainability Commission again because I sit on that was that we decided to be proactive in that trusted advisor role and they brought back forward several suggested policies that we take up and, and look at in, in terms of uh, uh, council action. So I think that kind of formalizing that role a little bit more I think would be very advantageous to the commissions. It also uh, goes directly to their worth and whether or not people think they're wasting their time or not. Um, and then finally, our interactions with the count, count with, with the with the uh, boards and commissions, I think we don't do a very good job of that. I think we meet some of the commissions. We meet with them once a year when we approve their work plan, and that's about it. And I I would like us to see more frequent but shorter periods of time where even if we took a 45 minute part of a work session, did three 15 minute commissions once three times a year and had them talk to us about the issues or had us question, ask questions, but have that more interaction more frequently, but you know, don't take up 90 minutes, but ha have it be able to be more relevant for, for all of the, the boards and commissioners. Cause I, I know that I often hear that from them that they don't get enough time in front of the council and they don't understand what, uh, uh, what they're expected to do. So I think that would help a lot. So those are my three things. Mike. Thank you, Mayor. I agree with a lot of what was said, and certainly thank you. Um, specifically, I, there are two changes, um, one of which I'd like to make to our boards and committee structures, and one that I'd be willing to make, I suppose, is the best way to frame it. What I'm willing to make is the one Betty recommended. I, I have questions about the usefulness and on, ongoing utility of the police commission. Um, it's genesis as I understand it and remember it was after Laura Magani and after the first auditor <laughs> efforts, it was another way to try and help build trust between the community and the police department. And that as a means for everyday citizens to be involved in the policies for the the police department, how the officers do their job, this was an opportunity to comment on that with the general public before the chief made his final decisions. And the POM, the police operations manual, has one final editor, and that's the police chief. He gets to decide, and the city manager, you know, and then to us. But th that mechanism where citizen volunteers can advise the chief on those policies before he issues the final ones, um, he has said to me that if the police commission did not exist, he would want that kind of voluntary um, input one way or another in some capacity. And so what our new chief will want is germane to the question. But I think that the establishment of the auditor took away a big chunk of the reason for the police commission to exist in the first place, place which was to reestablish that trust. Um, on the other piece, I think that several of our boards and commissions work very well in their format of how their membership is 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 um, created. One of the challenges that you listed that many people feel that I certainly do is the composition, a representative composition of some of our boards and commissions. And to that end, I, I would uh, like to see us have a budget committee that was composed much like the Sustainability Commission is. And it would be my strong preference that each of the counselors got to make a direct appointment to budget committee. Um, I think that would certainly give us the, because we always end up in the argument about whether what part of town has the greatest influence on budget committee. And I think that's at least a way for us to say, well, if I, if I don't want to choose from somebody from Ward 5, then I, and I think there's someone else, then that's that's more qualified, then that's my choice. <clears throat> but at least it gives the opportunity for each part of our community to be equally represented on that important committee. So to the, I don't know the appropriate time for that conversation, but I would be supportive of that.
Uh, Claire. Thanks. So just some general thoughts. Um, I uh, appreciate Councillor Pryor's comments. I, I agree with a lot of those. Um, I um, And I would be fine. I actually think there's some value in taking a work session to go through each board and commission and, you know, revisit their purpose, their char charter, whether or not they're fulfilling that purpose and do they still have value for the city. Um, I think that could serve one to re reinforce whether or not that's the case. And if not, what do we do about it? Um, I also think that's a way to help um, let other members of the community understand that we have these opportunities to get involved and bodies to which they can actually provide input if they're more comfortable going there or think that's more important than coming you know, to our public forum or however they might give input to this council. So it provides another place in the community for community members to provide input on issues that are important to them. Um, I, I don't really support kind of ad hoc questioning of whether a current commission is still needed. Um, I've served on the police commission for a number of years now. I personally have found um, that uh, the work of that commission in recent years I think has been very important in providing the chief and this body with a community perspective on how particular policies are crafted, which is not the work of the Civilian Review Board. That's, that's very different. Um, so I think that's a valuable conversation, but I'd like to have it in the context of looking at all of the boards and commissions, not just picking on one. Um, I don't worry too much about mission creep, even though they only come to us once a year with a report. You know, that's an opportunity for us to say, hey, wait a minute, you guys are getting off track here. But I wouldn't be opposed to what Councilor Zelink is, is suggesting. I think that's a nice way to have more touches with them as a full council. Uh, and I believe the Human Rights Commission has a formal liaison to the Police Commission. Um, there is a member of the Human Rights Commission who serves as a member of the Police Commission. I believe that is the case. That's true. Yes. And the city attorney is backing me up, as is Councillor Simple. Um, so, but I also agree that the piece about the advisory function can be too vague, and I know it's caused frustration on the part of some of our volunteers in the past. So that may be something that this council really might want to flesh out um, with some more specificity about what do we really mean by that, what are we expecting around that, um, and it may also be a little different between each of the committees because of their charge and their purpose. Those are my thoughts, thank you. I have a couple of requests for second rounds, but I just, I want to put this out there for all of you as counselors, is that you, in addition to thinking about how the citizens function on these boards and how these commissions function, you think about the role of counselors as you sit on these boards. Because in addition to these few official ones, there are a lot of other boards and commissions that you're all participating in. And if there's a question about the connection and the relevance of the work of those boards, some of that relevance rests with us in terms of why are we going to those meetings and what are we bringing back to council from those meetings. So I think it would be interesting to hear anyone comment on how you think we might proceed on that. The other piece, um, two things I wanted to toss out. One is that uh, one way we also might think about this in terms of the roles is where have we found the work of a commission to be particularly helpful and sort of identify those success stories to say this is a circumstance under which this commission really provided us with something very valuable, we wouldn't have gotten it otherwise, and are, is that something that can be replicated for, for other boards and commissions? So we might think in a process session around that. And the other piece, I, Alan has said this to me many times, so I'm just going to put it out here again, which is I think when we're looking at the agenda calendar, we could block in those committee reports on a quarterly basis so that all of the commissions and boards know when they're up. And then that's a, also a reminder to the counselors that your board or commission is coming up on a certain day, and so be prepared to support them as they report. So just out there. Oh, and, and now I have Betty and Alan for second round. Thank you. If if we had a every if we had those meetings frequently and everyone used their three minutes, I don't think we'd could do it in the amount of time that Alan has suggested. But the reason I raised my hand was when Mike mentioned what he thought we should, how he thought we should we should do the budget committee. That's the way it was done in the past. 
about more than 20 years ago, I think, they, each councillor appointed a budget committee member. And I think that's a good way to do it. I agree with that. It wouldn't have to be, I don't think it matters where they live, but the person that you think is qualified who's willing is the way I would do it. And I wish there was a way we could do the same thing with the Planning Commission, though there are only seven people on the Planning Commission. I don't know whether it's possible to increase it to eight and have each councillor appoint one of them or not, but I think that would be a good way to do that, too. I think it ends up being a popularity contest the way we do it now and who who kind of who has the most people who like them um, which is not a, a very good way to do it um, about the I, I was on the police commission I think a couple of times briefly um, and I quit I t actually I took Gary Pape's place the first time when he got tire tired of it and the mayor Tory asked for a volunteer and I volunteered and then I I thought this is not a good place to be but and I don't remember how I got it the second time, but anyhow, one thing that happened there, there was a representative from the Human Rights Commission, and this person didn't understand that there was a big controversy about whether that person could speak or, or just sit there, and how much, how much they were really a member and how much they were just somebody to report back to the Human Rights Commission. So <clears throat> I like the idea of training people and letting them know what's expected and what's permitted also. And um, and also, they all need to know that if, if they're advisory, that doesn't mean we have to follow their advice. That's And I think some people think, well, we decided that. Why didn't you do that? Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Alan? Uh, a couple of points. One was that the... <laughs> One was that the uh, when I was talking about the interaction with with commissions, I wasn't talking about the reports. Uh, I'll address the reports in a second. But having the commissioners or representatives of the commission come to council and talk to us is different than the reports. Uh, they uh, and so I think having them be in front of the council is is very important. It doesn't have to be quarterly. I think that's probably too often, but maybe two or three times a year. Other than just, other than in an, in addition to the approve the work plan time. So I think that needs to be um, uh, more calendared in. I agree with that. On the reports, uh, we're all over the map in terms of how we do reports from the ones that we do. Uh, and I'm wondering if we can't more put some structure and formalization around that. Maybe a template like we do with the work session polls is a good idea where we fill them out and say, okay, this quarter we did this and staff could bird dog this, corral us and get us to fill it out. And maybe it could be a written report as opposed to a, um, uh, um, a, uh, a an oral report and then people can supplement that whatever they want. But I, I don't feel like I get enough information from the reports about what's happening at all the different commissions because of that because of the way we do it um, and then and then uh, finally the commission to commission liaisons when I was mentioning that as more formalized I meant in their bylaws that says this commission will have a, a of one on, uh, on on this commission and vice versa and and one of the things that uh, we found uh, when I was talking to the folks at the Sustainability Commission, they said, if it's a good idea, we might do it, but if it's in our bylaws, we will do it. And I, uh, and I think it's up to the council to determine when it's a good idea in consultation with the commissions about which ones should be cross-fertilized on a more formal basis. Uh, so that would take some modifications to the bylaws. Councillors Link, I have a quick follow-up question on that, um, which you guys can address offline, but um, clarifying the difference between a liaison versus a member. So, you know, Eugene, the Police Commission, Human Rights Commission have in their uh, bylaws or in code the member provision, but for example, the Civil Civilian Review Board has in their bylaws a liaison to the Human Rights Commission, and there's a difference between the two. And so I think to what extent you guys are able to clarify what exactly um, you want around membership versus liaison, which I think the liaison is a little more attend, uh, you know, be in the audience, maybe that's more just be there, report back versus member, which is full be voting team. member. Yeah. So I think I, in, in terms of for staff moving forward, being clear about what which of those two you'd like us to explore well, think, or both. I think it depends on the, the nature of the committee to committee, uh, whether or not they should be at the table. And if they're at the table, then do they vote or not vote is another question, or whether or not they're just liaisons, which is 
I don't know that just liaisons actually gets us a whole lot, it, 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 uh, but I'd be open to looking at that. But I, th I think if you're at the table, it's substantially different than just being a liaison. If you're at the table, that means you're participating. Uh, and, and if you're voting, that's even more of a, uh, of, a, of, a, of a more substantive role. So I think we need to look at that in terms of all those, that gradient. But um, I think more formalizing it and getting it into the bylaws and figuring out what we want to do is, is really important. Catherine, did you have something you wanted to uh, clarify? Jason actually hit on it. And so part of that discussion that you'll want to have that um, Councilor Zelenka is, is getting at is if you do want to have it so the commission to commission is a voting member, then you'll need to discuss. That would need to be in code. So you'll need to look at. And so the um, two voting members, the way for the police commission, they say there's 12 members at the police commission. One member will be the, uh, someone from the Human Rights Commission and one member will be from the mm -hmm. Civilian Review Board. So though they're actually counted as two of the 12. So part of that discussion you'd want to have is, are we changing the number of members for that by adding a voting member from another commission? Or are we just going to, or do we want to fill up one of the, for example, uh, 11 Human Rights Commission positions with a member from another. So that's just going to be part of your discussion. And that all, if we, if it's something beyond having a liaison that is a formalized attendance and it's something where you want to make, have a voting member and that it would need to be a code amendment. So we just want to make sure we go down all those paths. Okay, so I have a process question about how we proceed from here. I was just thinking about that, Mayor. So, uh, one of, so what we're hearing, at least some of the highlights that I'm hearing, is that there's interest in discussing the role, purpose of the committee, interest in planning for more frequent updates, um, council member role in the boards and commissions, and also looking at, you know, some of the work that's been done by boards and commission and seeing where the value add is and thinking about that. And then some also standardization around the work that different boards and commissions are doing and how to have that so I think that what we need to do if it would be okay, um, I okay um, is to take a minute and go back and look at all the information that we received and look at coming back with another process session if that's of interest to you guys and bring back the information that you're asking for in addition there's a follow-up to the work that we've provided today and then um, get some clarity as to where uh, council would like to proceed in some of these topics that you raised today that sounds good to me, and it, it, it sounds like the list is a little uneven, so some are deeper dives than others, so sort of just putting that out there. And the other thought is the, the extent to which some of these conversations about the role of the commissions might relate to some of our goal-setting priorities for the year, uh, how those might dovetail. So as we go into our goal-setting session in February or so, we might think about this as part of that. Or some elements of this, not all of it, but okay. Okay. Any other comments from council? Actually, done a few minutes early. Congratulations. Yeah, <laughs> the meeting is closed. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Mm.